I want to address uh, this morning with your help and inspiration and the support of your good energy, which I presume is you donating to the cause this morning by being here. Uh, I, I hope to open a few more uh, depths or aspects of, of the mystery of God's presence all the time. Now, and now, and now. And so, actually, the theme is a little misleading because the presence of God isn't so much on a daily basis as a moment-to-moment -moment basis. So it's really now, after now, after now, after now. And, and so it's living always in the presence of God without effort. I emphasize without effort because some people try too hard and then they get discouraged because it doesn't respond to effort. It's a gift that you sort of uh, slide into or slip into as, as you let go little by little of the obstacles to the presence of God. And, and do you know what the chief obstacle to the presence of God really is? Just thinking that God is absent. Stop thinking that and God will always be present because that's the actual fact. So the whole discipline of centering prayer is in the service of learning that, that the greatest reality about us and about all other things is the presence of God. This is not a thought, but an, it's not even an experience. It's simply a fact. And, and that's what I'd like to emphasize this morning, that, that you don't have to go anywhere to find God or do anything particular, but just stop doing whatever you're doing, especially stop thinking every now and then as a discipline, and after a while you get acquainted with the fact that but without thinking, God is always present, and on some secret level of reassurance, call it faith, hope or charity is, is always available. And it's only us that are not available to this presence. And so by letting go of any idea or any feeling or any thought that God is absent, the truth of this uh, marvelous existence that God has placed us in, which is really his own existence, begins to become more and more habitual, easy, delightful, reassuring. It doesn't take away suffering, but it takes away any fear of suffering. It's our attitude towards pain and suffering that really causes suffering. <laughs> Actually, you feel pain, I suppose. But uh, there... The, the, the main thought that we need to get is that you don't have to think about God to be in God's presence. Why is that so hard? Well, it's just that we uh, have habitually learned to think about God and we identify what we think God is with what God actually is not the same thing at all. So God gently but relentlessly undermines any thought that you have of God. Sometimes this is very uncomfortable depending on how attached you are to your particular idea of God that usually is colored by childhood impressions or, or emotionally charged thoughts about God that we picked up in early youth, like the idea that we have to placate God, the idea that we have to earn God's love, the idea that we have to make ourselves lovable to God. Ridiculous. You, you, 
Do you have to make yourself lovable to your mother? <laughs> and even if your mother is too busy working to love you, grandma is always there, and, or grandpa, and they have no difficulty because they don't usually have to change the diapers and so on. They can just enjoy your beautiful being as an infant. And so a child in the arms of, of grandma or grandpa is a good image of what the, our relationship to God actually is. We're always in the arms of this loving parent or grandparent, and, and there's nothing you have to do to earn it or to win it. It's already yours. Uh, it's, it's free. And so everything about God is a gift. And unfortunately, we've developed a habit of thought which has a basis of truth. Our relation to God should be loving and just and a lot of other shoulds. But it's not going to change how God feels towards you. It only gives you more confidence in God's love if you are at peace with God. So it's, the problem is not with God, it's with us. You don't have to do anything to win this love. And, the, and it's, it's this faith of God as loving that was the chief thrust of Jesus' teaching, especially in the parables. Parables are kind of windows onto the heart of God that in Jesus' time uh, radically changed or revolutionized the way that uh, his disciples or those who listened to Jesus understood him. The word father uh, was known in among the Jewish prophets, but it usually referred to God as the, as the father or the creator or the source or the special uh, patron of Israel. It didn't have the connotations, as a rule, of, of, of a particular, in other words, God was the father of Israel in general, not of particular people. That was the mentality of that particular era. What Jesus suggested is that God is not just father in the sense of, of the source of our being at every level. That's certainly true. That's the creative presence of God. So, so let's distinguish two presences. The creative presence of God that sustains everything in existence, moment by moment, and that sustains us, body, soul, and spirit. At every level of our being, God is present, adjusting himself, just as God is present to every level of being in the universe. God is just as present to a wave or a particle in the subatomic world that only the most powerful instruments can even perceive. And, and here is where, in our time, science has become the greatest friend of religion in many ways because it provides us with what the mystics have, already, have always intuited, namely, that everything in creation is, is interrelated, interconnected, and interdependent. When the Big Bang happened, Everything that ever existed was present, physically present in potential, uh, potentially. And so in the first trillionth of a trillion of a second, the Big Bang, 13 or 18, uh, it's a little uncertain how many billions of years it actually happened, but the first element was hydrogen. And then, as this spread, it, it transformed into other uh, elements, and finally the elements that are necessary for human life. Usually these are, are produced when the galaxies crash into each other. We'll talk about fireworks. God must really enjoy these fireworks. But anyway, when the galaxies collide, they produce 
the kind of elements that make planets and planets ultimately produce the kind of elements on which life depends. So as, as we sit here blissfully in this beautiful space, we're, we're actually the fruit of about, let's say, 15 billion years of preparation. So that you don't think much about having a cup of coffee, but it took 15 billion years <laughs> to make this possible. Here, that's a plug for the coffee makers, if there ever was one. <laughs> but they haven't thought of advertising in that way. But, but just to blow your nose, to brush your teeth, to get up in the morning, this is something consciously that has never happened in 15 billion years until the human species finally evolved out of these, all these other elements and earlier species. So it's a good idea to think that in our normal everyday life, in the little things you do every day, this is a triumph of creation, and God is, must be very pleased to see us do our little actions. And in comparison with all the wonderful things we're able to do, uh, why should we concentrate on the things that we disapprove of doing so much? Yes, they're important, but, but the pleasure that God has in each of us, just by being human, and now if you add the good things that, that you do, then the whole weight of how God looks upon us shifts from the doubts, self-doubts we have about whether we're lovable or whether we're uh, candidates for divine life, is, is, is shifted from doubt to a, a presumption of certitude, not based on ourselves, but on the actual goodness of God in our uh, creation. Well, creation, then, is, is absolutely an extraordinary expression of love, and each of us is manifesting in our uniqueness something about the divine goodness that no one else can ever replace. It's that your individuality. But we're not just individuals, we're also part of this human species. And, and, and in our time, in our century, in our millennium, if the world lasts that long at this rate, at least you can be sure that, that never before have it, has it been more important to emphasize the unity of the human species or the human family. Jesus in the parables was constantly undermining the societal or social, political or religious boundaries that people keep co constantly setting up as, as, a, as a kind of either out of pride or security or power or one of those primitive motives that uh, we, we uh, function from in very early childhood, since you need them in order to survive. But as we sit here, literally, the most important thing about each of us is not us, but God's presence in us, manifesting the infinite tenderness and, and love of God in a, in a way that is no one else will ever be able to do. In other words, God is experiencing what it's like to be human in you. And, and, and this he seems to find great pleasure in, contrary to whatever you may think about it. <laughs> so if you have any doubt that there's any problem with this, those of you who are uh, uh, who, who are especially Roman Catholics should remember that, that the sacrament of reconciliation is one of the seven sacraments. That means if you ever do something contrary to your conscience, all you have to do is go to confession, and that's the end of it. I would add, however, 
that you don't have to wait to go to confession. Most of us are doing something seven to 70 times every day that, you know, we just assume not have done. I mean, we said a nasty word, or we didn't look at someone who, who needed a kind smile, or, or uh, any of the 101 things that, that we sometimes do when we're not in the presence of God. It's so important to remember that you only have to be sorry now for all of your sins to be wiped away. No need to wait to go to confession. You do that at an appropriate time if you can find a confessor nowadays. <laughs> the main thing is that as soon as you're sorry, God has totally forgotten whatever our faults were, and he would be very happy if we would forget it too. <laughs> as I've said elsewhere, if you have guilt feelings, for more than 10 or 15 seconds, it's neurotic. It has nothing, <laughs> it has nothing to do with genuine contrition or compunction. It's simply the, the sadness that comes from pride in recognizing that we're not as, 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 as big shot or as perfect as we thought we would be. There's, there's a certain, we now know from psychology that there's certain temperamental predispositions uh, uh, towards negative feelings about ourselves. For instance, some people are born with a perfectionistic personality. If anything goes wrong, they blame themselves. Whatever they do, it's never good enough. And so they're constantly harried, you might say, uh, by this shoulds or have to, I have to do this to be happy, I have to do this to be faithful. Well, here's a good principle for everyday life. Whatever you feel you have to do, don't do it. <laughs> Whatever you feel you should do, avoid it. And, and whatever you feel you must do, go in the opposite direction. <laughs> If you feel that you shouldn't do that, then you should, you should do it. Okay. <laughs> Shoulds, have tos, musts are temperamental dispositions. And they have really nothing to do with the love of God, but they're rather self-centered or self-serving concerns uh, that are rooted in our security needs that are always exaggerated. Remember, it, it, it's really very simple to figure out what's wrong with us. So simple, so obvious. <laughs> you look at any baby one day old, they're motivated by three things. Security needs, survival needs, that's one. Affection and esteem and approval needs, that's two. And power and control needs, that's three. The latter tends to develop a little later in life. But if you withdraw from the child any one of those needs, it develops overcompensatory uh, programs in order to get what it wants. It soon finds out that if it yells loud enough, it'll get some attention to one of its needs. But this is not uh, the fully human way of responding. This is the way that's appropriate for an infant to get through that particular period of life. But as, as we grow and become self-conscious, and, and especially when we eat, reach the age of reason, then we're meant to evaluate our feelings and our needs and to moderate them appropriately because it's the unlimited desire for security, the unlimited desire for approval, and the unlimited desire for control that is, is basically the source of all our afflictive emotions. And hence, <coughs> when your emotions are upset, uh, the body is so designed that it pours suitable hormones into the bloodstream to deal with this crisis, most of them being uh, artificial. 
But the result is that your, your poor arteries are squeezed by your tension of the muscles, and you're on the way to a heart attack or some other diseases if you live long enough. And for some people, it's not too long if they're upset. So whatever you think, whatever your belief system is, that's what your feelings respond to. Because in everyday life, you're constantly experiencing the frustration of programs for happiness circulating around control, affection and approval, and security that can't possibly be realized because they're fantastic. Nobody's going to respect them. And, uh, and everybody is practicing the same stupid <laughs> project. And so you're in competition with six and a half billion other people <laughs> trying to do the same stupid thing. Well, naturally, you're going to have tension and stress and diabetes and heart attacks and strokes and what, because the body is being tortured by these afflictive emotions that are uh, activating the, the physiology of the body to deal with, with difficulties that normally don't come that fast. There are some real difficulties, and that's when you need to respond with fight or flight mechanisms. But some people are responding every few hours to a crisis. The red lights are always flashing, and somebody is always challenging our demand for happiness through one of those three instinctual needs. Power, control, affection, esteem, and approval, and security. So, so to return now to this uh, presence of God, uh, I might just add before moving on, however, that when you're confronted by people who are upset, don't be disturbed. The worst they can do is, is shoot you or something. Then, you'll, <laughs> then you go to heaven. Death is not a disaster. It's simply the next stage of the spiritual journey once you're thoroughly on it. So, so one, should, one should have a friendly, uh, develop, try to, a friendly attitude towards it. It's a promotion. It's not a <laughs> demolition. <laughs> well, anyway, the, the beauty, the beauty of this creative uh, support of our being every moment. In other words, creation is not a one-time event, but is going on all the time, every trillionth of a trillionth of a second. And, and now, by these sophisticated machines, they can calibrate a, down to a trillionth of a second. So the Buddhists have, a, have an intriguing idea that I think is, is, is worth thinking about, and that is they say that we come into, a, into an out, uh, uh, come into and leave and come back to, into existence uh, 68 times per second. I don't know how they got 68. <laughs> But in actual fact, modern machinery has revealed that you go in and out of existence maybe uh, a, t a trillion times a second. Well, naturally, with our present uh, sensory apparatus, we don't notice it. So it's like a movie going by very fast. A movie, as you know, is just a series of frames going by at a pace where you don't notice the distinction. It looks like one, just because of the speed, a continuous move. So our life is really a continuous movement of, of events that is going by so fast you don't notice that you're actually dying every trillion of a second, a trillion times. Someday, of course, the machines or whatever it is will stop, and I guess that's the end of you in this life. But the beginning of, of, of a better arrangement that's for sure. But besides this creative force that's a sign of God's great love for us and, and a manifestation of God's love for us, what Jesus reveals is that this is not just any old father. 
but a father who he calls Abba. Abba is the Aramaic, that was Jesus' language, term for daddy or papa or the old man or whatever it would be, the idiom that would indicate a loving, very present, very close and nurturing daddy, the kind of daddy who's constantly picking the child up in his arms and playing with it and kissing it and hugging it and caressing it and taking care of all its needs. So actually, the father that Jesus reveals is not the patriarchal father that was the popular concept of a head of a household in Jesus' time, but is really more like a mother. In other words, this father has all the qualities of a loving mother, nurturing, caring, affectionate, holding, always available, always concerned. If this, is, this reflects the attitude of God, and this is what a contemplative attitude for daily life really comprises. Centering prayer is only a laboratory, so to speak, or as I've said elsewhere, the office of the divine therapist in which our, our wounds or our difficulties in recognizing reality as it actually is are gradually cured. It's a, it's a treatment center, only it's a private place within us, as you know, where we leave behind our ordinary concerns and make ourselves totally vulnerable to this presence. Now, if you're scared of this presence, it doesn't feel that comfortable. But what's making you scared of this presence? Your belief system, your ideas. Drop your idea of God during the time of centering prayer, as, as you know is recommended, and pretty soon God has the chance of introducing himself to you as he is, not through a preconceived idea or belief system that may be good in itself, but which you may be misinterpreting or which may have been misinterpreted for you by well-intentioned but psychologically totally unenlightened teachers. <laughs> so, so, so the ideas that we need to get into our heads if we're going to follow any belief system for this century are to emphasize God's love for us the unity of the human family, the, this, the, the uh, letting go of fear in any form, which is actually the opposite of love. Remember that when you're afraid of something. The opposite uh, of fear is not necessarily security, it's, it's love. And so as you love more, fear will disappear. As John says in one of his epistles, the evangelist John, perfect love casts out fear. That means it doesn't just get rid of fear, it throws it out, it casts it out. Notice the, the uh, activity involved in love. You can't love greatly and, and still have fear. It just goes, it just dissolves. There's no room for fear in, in the exercise of divine love. And, and think, if you can remember back to your uh, first few days of life, not too many people can without a certain kind of therapy, but, but if you could, you, would you be afraid of, of uh, resting in the arms of grandpa or grandma? Not at all. Uh, you somehow know that this is a safe place. Or in mama's arms, it's a safe place because if she's holding you close, you can hear the reassuring heartbeat that kept you going for the nine months that you were in the world's most delightful environment <laughs> that was ever created. So, so you're reassured. Terrible trauma to be born, they say. I can't remember it. Maybe you can't either. <laughs> and probably it's just as well. <laughs> but 
modern medicine, with all due respect to the medical effort, was not too enlightened in, 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 uh, in how, in, how to bring children into the world. They got so technically that the first experience of a child and emerging from the most delightful environment there is was to be in this rather cold room with bright lights shining and it's never seen the light. Masked men and women all around <laughs> with sharp knives. Who wants to come into that kind of a world? So the first experience of children in those days was trauma. And I guess they still do it a lot. Then they would grab the baby and take it away from its mother and stick it in a bassinet with other screaming youngsters. And, and the, whole, uh, the whole contribution of love as touch and affection is, is, is withheld at the moment when the baby needs it the most. Now, how important uh, affection, physical affection, Manifesting love is for the infant is, is much, much marvelously uh, exemplified in, in, a, in a piece in the paper I saw not long ago. And this is this was about two premature youngsters. Each was put in a separate incubator, with all the, all with all the sophisticated modern equipment, with tubes and wires all through it. Poor things. I wonder what a baby figures out life is going to be like when it starts out wrapped up in all these wires. Well, anyway, one of them was going to make it, and the other was obviously dying. So this, this nurse, contrary to hospital rules, all rules need to have exceptions to be really worthwhile. But anyway, she heroically said, I think we'll try an experiment. And she put the two babies together in the same incubator. Someone took a picture. <laughs> I saw it in the paper. Maybe you saw this. And there you see they're both on their little tubbies. You don't see their faces. And the stronger one has its little arm around the shoulder of the one who was dying. In a couple of days, the other child started to get well, too. And you could see it in the picture very moving little picture. So just that little sign of love, because life is so powerful at, at, in supporting itself, was just the straw that, that added the weight to save this baby's life. So what babies need and what we need is not sophisticated equipment only, but above all, the feeling of being loved and the security that only love can bring. So I venture to say that all of us are only brought into full life or human health or wholeness by being loved. And that means by somebody else. And that means, above all, by, by God himself. Nothing is more reassuring than to feel oneself loved by God. And of course, as you know, in centering prayer, this is part of the therapy. Put it into psychological terms. It's the sense that uh, dwells up in one as one is silent from the thoughts that usually disturb us or that cause doubt or that are judgmental or evaluative. All of those goals that people have in doing their prayer are left behind in centering prayer. Remember? No desire to have the mind a blank. No desire for an experience of God. No desire for a sense of peace. No expectation for any particular kind of experience. Certainly not making the mind a blank or having no thoughts. It's rather a making ourselves vulnerable to the presence of God just as God is, that is, beyond thought, thinking, experiences. Nothing could be easier. It's just that we think this is hard because we've never done it or never done it that much. Once you start doing this, this is the paradigm 
for daily life. Only in daily life, we don't just passively, so to speak, let thoughts that are, uh, go by that are harmful or damaging or useless, but in daily life, we make the effort to let go of afflictive feelings, emotions, or thoughts by turning ourselves to the presence of God and remaining there. St. John of the Cross says somewhere that human health consists in the conscious awareness of God. That's what human health is, because in that presence, all the exaggerations that were prompted by a search for happiness that we didn't know how to find are taken away because one is beginning to taste, however inchoate or beginning away, we're beginning to sense or taste what happiness really is. And this is the reassurance of God's love for us. And it takes many forms and probably is adapted to each one of our needs, each one of us particular needs. So that if, if you've had oppression or rejection or heavy loss of loved ones in early life, God will give you what you need, namely the sense that some, someone more loving than any possible could, person could be is enfolding you, is holding you up, is pressing you to the mysterious heart of God, which is not a heart as we know it, but is all uh, the, the connotations or, or meanings or overtones of, of a love that we sometimes uh, symbolize by speaking of, of heart. God is so close that there's no bodily organ that is a symbol of him. It, and so this uh, idea of God as present, as loving, as, as the dearest of parents is precisely what, the, what is the first experience, you might say, or some people are a little slow in getting <laughs> to this point, is, is going to happen uh, in most people who do the prayer regularly in the course of the first few weeks, months, or they might, uh, for some reason, which God alone knows, it may be better for us not to have that feeling right away. But it usually comes then better than ever. And while everybody else is, is, is enjoying uh, the first fruits of centering prayer, you may be wondering what the hell is, oh, excuse me, what they're <laughs> talking about. <laughs> but just wait a year, and, and then if you're in a prayer group, they start moaning and bemoaning that God has forgotten them and left them. Meanwhile, you're, you're in the lap of, of, of this incredible affection that you've been waiting for for a year, and you don't know what they're talking about. So everybody, uh, God adjusts himself to each of us, and, and this you can be sure of. Whatever you need, you'll get. So if you've suffered rejection, you're likely to get uh, the most consolation during the first year. Of, of, of a practice like, like centering prayer. And, and this is also why we shouldn't be uh, stuck up or something, because we have a lot of spiritual consolation. Some people have more than others. The reason some people, maybe even the saints, had these wonderful mystical experiences that they usually were told by their confessor to write about, it's not because they're better than we are. They were in tougher shape than we are. <laughs> and so they needed more consolation or more reassurance. So uh, for all we know, you might as well feel sorry for them rather than <laughs> envy them. Now, I've been at this journey a long time and haven't, still haven't made much progress, as you can see. <laughs> But I have outgrown certain attitudes that, that I now recognize were a little childish or, or immature in my spiritual life. So I no longer look for any consolation. I, I would be kind of embarrassed if I had it and say, 
oh, this is a distraction. Uh, and it really is. At some point, any experience is not a, as close as a communion with God as no experience at all. Now, this is bad news, maybe for some of you. <laughs> but my question is, well, then why, why are you in this journey? Is it for yourself or is it for God? And, and if it's for God, then whatever you receive psychologically, you trust God that this is, this is what you need psychologically, but on the level of reality, you know that in secret, God is giving you everything you need and more than you need and greater gifts than if you experience them. Now, this is, this is a hard thing to understand right away. But what freedom you'd have, folks, if you had no expectations of spiritual consolation or reassurance and just assume that God is giving you everything you need moment by moment and that every moment has within it everything you need to be completely happy. God is reality. God is reality. If that's true, it, since you're usually in contact with reality, I presume, <laughs> even if you're in a mental institution with all kinds of illusions, at least you're in the institution, and that's <laughs> reality. So you can never get away from God. No place to go because God is already here. Again, uh, we say in theology, God is infinite. Have, have you heard this uh, saying? Infinite, mean, meaning isness without any limitation whatsoever. The, the famous saying that God gave of his name to Moses, remember, it was I am. And uh, and it said twice, instead of saying, I am Thomas, he said, I am, I am. So I am is God's name. And how did he get there? By being I am. So it, 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 it means isness in every direction, up, down, or no direction. Wherever you go, God is there. God is beyond being and beyond non-being. He's both personal and impersonal. There's no gender in God because God is, 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 is total unity. But at the same time, and this is why it's so it's impossible to grasp who God really is, God is also infinite diversity and infinite possibility at the same time. In our case, we experience diversity as divisive under most circumstances. We're experiencing that now in the global attitudes of re religions and belief systems and nationalities uh, throughout the world. Diversity means boundaries, protection, defenses, and all the other things that preoccupy people. But, but in actual fact, where there is unity, diversity becomes complementarity. It's no longer divisive, but enriching. And this is the insight that is missing in the human family now and in the process of globalization that seems to be happening, whether we like it or not. But as, as Christians and as, as contemplatives, uh, the energy that you are receiving from God is more powerful than all the negativity in the world. So as you grow in, in the in your spiritual journey, everybody is growing. You, you, can't, uh, you can't help but affect everything in the universe moment by moment by your activities or even by your thoughts. And, and if this sounds a little uh, mystical, it, it, it is backed up now by, by astrophysics or, or uh, quantum mechanics theory in which in which it's proven now that you 
at least it's asserted by cutting-edge physicists, that you can't have a thought without affecting everything else in the universe instantaneously. Again, the living cell is so constructed that it's basically the same in every living thing. So between us and a mouse, as far as your cells go, there's not much difference. A couple of extra genes in there somewhere, maybe, <laughs> but not much. The difference between uh, races or colors of people is so infinitesimal, it's absolutely ridiculous to make any division based on, on color or ethnicity or, or some such things. In other words, it's, it's our wrong ideas of people or reality or based on our need to be defensive. Sometimes reasonable defenses are, are in order because the human family as a whole emphasizes its diversity, hence its divisiveness, without its unity, which would transform divisiveness into a common feeling of accountability for everyone on Earth and indeed everyone who ever lived or will live. We, we have a oneness with them that is part of the reality of the universe that we can't change, but we can deny to our great misfortune as individuals, but also as a family, as the, as the human race. Now, it seems from the gospel that the invitation to be transformed is extended to everyone on earth, no exception. The, the parables are, 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 are so clear. In the great banquet, for instance, which all exegetes recognize as a symbol of who gets into heaven or who enters the kingdom of God, uh, the, the householder, remember, first invites his peers and they decline. Then because the household is, is, is not filled, he invites the poor and the lame and the maimed whom the prophets of Israel foresaw were God's favorites. The hero of the Psalms, for instance, is obviously the one afflicted or suffers poverty in some form, mental, spiritual, or physical. This is, this is God, the apple of God's eye, as the Psalm says, is, is those in need. So the greater the need, the greater the love or, that God wants to, uh, wants to give. Well, in this situation, then, the, 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 the future is right now. And all that God has to give us that can possibly be communicated short of the, of the transformation that uh, takes place after death. In other words, the last veil between us and God is the body. And when that passes away, then the reality of God's presence becomes all pervasive, all delightful, and eternally present, since in the next life there, there is no time as we understand it. Everything is now. And, uh, and thus, this, this movement of, of uh, into the presence of God is, is, is crucial for our own well-being but not just for ourselves. As soon as you seek the kingdom primarily for yourself, you're on the wrong road because the kingdom is not just for you and I. And, and it, unless everyone else is saved too, you can't be perfectly happy. That's the, the mystery of the unity of the human family that has not been fully understood or preached up till now. But it, it sure is present in the gospel. It, 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 and it, it, you just have to concentrate it on it a bit. Uh, one of the, one of the uh, things that Paul says, for instance, is that, that, that as the spiritual journey grows within us and the fruits of the Spirit manifest themselves spontaneously, charity, joy, peace, gentleness, self-control, patience, and the others. These are things that appear without effort. They're the, they're the normal releasing 
of the divine energies that we received in baptism, but perhaps may have received at, at the moment of birth. We don't really know. Baptism is, is a commitment to accept the invitation that is extended in the gospel. But that extension is extended to all the human family uh, as a kind of remote call to divine union, symbolized by the coming of the Magi in the infancy narrative. These were people who were not Jews. They were not men of, of a religious faith that was known in Israel. Maybe they were Zoroastrians, I don't know. But in any case, they're symbols of seekers of God of all time. And, 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 and they were able to find the infant in the crib, meaning that the extension to of divine union is given to everybody from the beginning of time until now. One of the things that is sometimes forgotten in our, in our religious instruction is that God didn't just create the new covenant. The new covenant suggests, of course, there was an old one. But in actual fact, there were several covenants before the old one. And, and these are, were identified by some of the great predecessors, theologically, of the Second Vatican Council. One is there's the pre-Noah covenant that God had. Then there was the post-Noah covenant, symbolized by the rainbow, if you remember your, your scriptures. Then there was the covenant, apparently, with Melchizedek. Then there was the Abrahamic covenant, covenant. So God has been, been reaching out uh, all through human history, and his covenants have simply been getting better and more comprehensive. But that doesn't mean that the covenant, which really means salvation, was withdrawn from the previous covenant. And so there are people in the world today, I'm sure, in primitive cultures around the world, who are still in those covenants, and God is saving them through those means. And so much so that, uh, that it's, it's good to repeat this often enough because so much of the teaching of the Bat Second Vatican Council hasn't filtered down far enough to, to you folks in the pews. <laughs> it needs to be repeated again and again. The churches, uh, Catholic Church at least, the position is that, that the spirit is at work in all the other Christian denominations, and when you think of it, baptism is so much more important than any other kind of doctrinal difference that it's, it's incredible and a scandal, really, that the churches are, are not unified. And if they were unified, it would give an enormous surge of importance to the realization throughout the human family of its basic unity. Um, the marvelous uh, teaching now of the church is, oh, I felt so good when they, uh, you know, I, I had a grandma who was not a Catholic. My mother was not a Catholic. Oh, it was such a wonderful relief to realize, and I was brought up in non-Catholic schools, that my friends and buddies were not going to hell after all. <laughs> what a relief. I worried about grandma. I worried about my mother. And my father, he had stopped going to church. So I, I can't tell you how much, as a youngster, with a sensitive heart, I worried about everybody. I should have worried more about myself, I think, <laughs> be realistic. But anyway, we now can love the Protestants. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> we now can admire and love people of other religions, because the later documents uh, from the present Holy Father suggest that grace is working in other world religions and that some of their rituals, they, the Holy See is not their place to decide which ones, are, are salvific. They're like sacraments. This doesn't mean that all the religions are the same, but that they're, in a sense, complementary and maybe certain religions that have come out of different cultures are necessary for the cultural conditioning of those people, at least until 
the world becomes thoroughly globalized and becomes one village, which might not be the best thing on Earth, because diversity is very enriching. So, so there's a value to other religions that needs to be respected. And so it's, this is the time, then, to develop our understanding of the other religions and our respect for them. And, and, uh, and, and this is especially incarnated in, in the Algerian martyrs who happened to be Trappists who lived in, in Algeria, surrounded totally by Islamic uh, society, who shared the poverty of their neighbors and simply bore witness, a Christian witness, a Christian presence. So what, what they have discovered is that missionary work is, is primarily to bring the presence of Christ into the culture and live uh, uh, identified with the local people and to share uh, their uh, respect for their religion and so on. These people became martyrs because the extremists in that part of the world uh, couldn't endure having them, uh, having their presence there. So, so, so this is one of the, one of the signs of the time. Is that many missionary orders are rethinking their, what their approach to the missions might be in the light of the witness of those people who laid down their lives, not so much for a cause, but to, to make the face of Christ visible through presence, a presence that was not out to convert the Islamic people, but simply to share their life together and be present. So what this is saying is, is a new understanding of what it means to go into the whole world and preach the gospel. What it, it's been understood a certain way up until now, but now we're invited to realize that it's you who are a missionary in your inmost being in the degree that you enshrine the presence of God. And that that presence doesn't necessarily have to go anywhere, but to go there is, is a powerful witness. But it's who you are, it's your being that invisibly is pouring positive energy into the universe, overcoming the negativity of generations of false selves, put it in that terminology, and that you have no idea of what empowerment is, is communicated to you in contemplative prayer, except that little by little, you can't help but do good and love other people. It, you can't sit on divine love. You, you be, it'll begin to spread and it'll expand appropriately in your circumstances according to your vocation. And so, it, so this is the sense, I think, in which Paul says, God is all in all. Come back to that idea. If God is infinite, then, it means there's no room for anything else. Unless you recognize that everything even that's created, is in God. If you recognize that you're in God, then you have the right idea. Translated into images like you're in the arms of God, that's very good. But even suffering is in God. All pain is in God. Everything that exists is somehow in God. And, 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 and so, there's no place to go to get away from God, but rather to accept the reality of God's presence is, is the greatest wisdom. And that this presence transcends any experience you can have. This is what is meant by pure faith. Pure faith believes that God is present without any human evidence at all. And, and this is what is the great work of the dark night that St. John talks about. It's the purification of faith, hope, and charity. So that your faith is not dependent on other people or, 
belief systems learned in early childhood, but rather on your certitude in God's presence without any human prop or evidence to support it. Obviously, you can only climb up to that degree of inner freedom slowly. But that means that as you get up and go out of here for lunch, <laughs> you're not really going anywhere. <laughs> you're just moving from one spot to another in God. God is the ground of your being. So whether you're asleep or awake or moving or still, always in God. And, and hence the psalmist says, be still and you will know that I am God. This is probably the best advice that was ever offered for all time. Even, even Ramana Maharshi, the great Hindu uh, pundit of the last century, said, you don't need any more advice than that in the Psalms. Be still. It's thinking, dear folks, that activates our belief system. And it's out of your belief system that you work, that you act. And hence, if your action or if circumstances contradict your belief system, you're constantly experiencing emotional affliction, grief, anger, discouragement, and so on. That's why I singled out, I should do this. If you feel you should do something, then it means you're almost certainly going to fail and, and the feeling arises of depression, just automatic. So why, why have the belief system that you should do anything? Do everything out of the love of God and under the movement of the spirit, which becomes clearer and clearer as contemplative prayer grows. And, and in spite of tragedy or disaster, you will always be happy at some deeper level because your, your wisdom tells you that everything uh, happens uh, according to God's uh, universal plan. And if we can surrender ourselves to that plan freely, you'll be perfectly happy even if you lose your life. Because our life is not an end in itself. And like the martyrs of Algeria, in losing it for the love of God, you make true life and love available for an, an enormous proportion of the human family. So the bottom line is, at least for our time, is accountability for everyone else. So if, if those of you who are on the Centering Prayer path and have moved into the Night of Sense, which happens rather soon, within a couple of years usually, for those who do the practice faithfully, you begin to see the dark side of your personality and the obstacles that the divine therapist points to in the course of your twice daily interviews in the inner room. That's Jesus calls the spiritual level of our being, the level beyond thinking and beyond uh, conversation. It's the movement from conversation to communion, from activity to receptivity. It's not an end in itself, but it prepares us for action saturated with the values of the inner room, which are peace, inner freedom, love, appropriate concern for everyone and everything that is a certain openness and vulnerability to God's healing uh, process. Infinite love means that God is all in all. That's a quote from Paul. Or, as he puts it in another place, Christ is everything in everyone. What that really means is that the, the, the goodness that is in each of us 
is, is, is God's presence in us. And our service of others is God's presence in others so that in actual fact, although we experience ourselves as doing things, what's really happening is that God present in us is serving God in others or greeting God in others or loving God in others. And in that sense, God is all in all. And, and, uh, and uh, according to Jesus' revelation, God is, 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 is love. Uh, St. John uh, clarifies that even more when he says, God is love. That is to say, he doesn't just show love as we do, but is love. And so the, the spiritual journey is, is a movement to do what God does, or to become like God. And that is that our destiny is not just to show love, this is an important start, the works of mercy, concern for others, an accountability that is even willing to bear the sufferings of other people for the love of God and for love of them. But above all, it means that, that God is calling us to manifest his love or, or to be loved the way God is. The extraordinary nature of love, as St. John of the Cross understands divine love, is that God, that, that divine love tries to make you equal. And, and, and in other words, God isn't satisfied with just loving you. He wants us to love him back equally. And how can that be? Only if we receive the Holy Spirit and the Spirit loves in us. Where does that leave the false self? Dead as a doornail. <laughs> have to let the false self go. Where does that leave the ego? Of no account whatsoever. So our over-attachment to our identity doesn't mean we become nothing at all or lose our uniqueness. It means that we finally found, find out who we actually are, which is, as God is, unconditional love. In other words, our life, our God, uh, in God finally penetrates us through and through, thus making us capable of being God with God. In other words, we can, you can only pass through the eye of a needle without the baggage of ego or any possessive attitude towards anything. Everything is at our service. As soon as you try to hang on of it, You've lost it. So, so it's not that anything changes except our attitude, which is to let go of our possessive attitude that ultimately is seeking happiness in something other than God. It can't work. So that as God draws us away from our over-attachment to our emotional programs for happiness, our desire for control, security, excessive security and approval, this freedom grows uh, to love, to love, to love, so that at some point we become aware that the secret of the universe is love. The consequence of that is that the meaning of the universe is sacrifice, because divine love is always giving itself away. That's its very nature. And so, once you've been through all the dark nights, purified your soul, which John of the Cross says is the equivalent of purgatory, the worst is still to come. <laughs> we might as well be honest. Because now that you are able to love, you're ready to take on, as Jesus did, the sufferings of the whole world. So I don't guarantee for those of you approaching the transformed union 
have no more troubles. It's not a magic carpet to bliss. It's a direct route to reality. And reality is total self-sacrifice. And so to be in heaven with any selfishness is to be very uncomfortable. To let go of our over-attachment. This is the therapy. And God lovingly is always helping us. He went through this with his disciples. You see it over and over again in the gospel. Without a word of self, uh, uh, without a word of blame or recrimination, he just points the truth to them. Like Martha, why are you anxious? He doesn't say, you're really not serving me at all. You're just looking for praise in this meal. No, there's no attack. It's just the invitation to look at the truth about ourselves so that they can be healed. And, and, and this uh, loving, loving healing process is only painful if, if you are closed in on yourself and afraid. Fear closes us in ourselves. Love opens and finds room in our heart for everyone, everyone. And so uh, having, uh, having reached a certain degree of love, we may be invited by God to, in, in the little ups and downs of every day, sufferings and concerns of daily life, these are not ours anymore. They're part of our participation in, in the Paschal mystery, in the salvation of the world. And so instead of being overwhelmed by our crosses, we realize that at a certain level, this is the greatest privilege we could have because now we're doing what God does all the time, namely giving ourselves away. It's, it's this humility of God that he were invited to participate in a humility that, in the case of God, seems to suggest that God's desire is to cease to be God. He has everything. Why should he care? But it is this infinite freedom that, and our participation in it that enables us to be free to love and free to suffer, free to sacrifice, just to be free. And this is the movement of contemplative prayer into divine union and unity and whatever is beyond that. But our destiny is, is only known by God. But as Paul says, no one, no one has ever has had the closest imagination regarding what God has in store for those who love him.